Hey there, my name's Crew. Welcome to our YouTube channel today. We believe that as you receive this content, your life's going to grow like never before. We say here at Elevate Life that as we elevate our thinking, we elevate our life. And before you jump into the message, hopefully you like, share, comment, subscribe to this channel for more content coming up. And a reminder, this is our year to advance, and advance we will. Enjoy the message. Really glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to jump in this morning talking about the world of tomorrow. You know, this series is really... Uh, about this thought process that says that all the decisions that you and I are making today is building the world that our grandkids are gonna live in. You know, when I was, uh, when I was growing up, I used to watch a lot of Cartoon Network and uh, Tex, they always had Tex Avery cartoons on Cartoon Network and Tex Avery is, you know, like more of my grandparents' generation kinda, but they had these really cool cartoons that, that Tex Avery made that were all like this, you know, the future's gonna look like this. And it was all this cool animation of, you know, your refrigerator's gonna make the food for you and your car's gonna drive to the store for you. It's like this Jetsons version of the future that people were, were trying to design and attempting to build. And uh, I think what, what happens, and this is true at least in my perspective, what happens in culture and what happens in the world is a product of decisions that were made by people that are honestly no longer alive. When we look at what's happening in our culture today, the roots of those decisions are 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. When you look at what was happening in America in the 1960s and the 1970s, um, what's happening in culture today with gender identity and all kinds of different things that we're navigating, the, the, the seeds that were sown in the 60s and 70s are harvesting right now with these people's grandkids that were doing this in the 1960s and 70s. So the decisions that you and I are making today, whether we want to be honest with ourselves, admit it or not, the, the decisions that we're making today are actually building the world of tomorrow that not just we're gonna live in, but our grandkids are gonna live in. So the question is, how do we build a great world tomorrow? How do we, how do we become these people that like these designers of futuristic things like a Gene Roddenberry who did Star Trek that kind of came up with a bunch of this cool stuff? How do we intentionally make decisions that build a great world? world for tomorrow. We've got to think that. We've got to, we've got to decide that. And a lot of us live in a context where, honestly, if we're honest with ourselves, our focus is mostly on us just kind of making it. You know, a lot of people that I've known uh, as they've gotten older, they say kind of two things when, once they get in their 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever, is they say, man, I hope that I live long enough that the, I hope I don't live long enough to see the money run out. And a lot of people are really concerned about Social Security because by the time my generation supposedly is on Social Security, the government won't be able to afford it. I hope that I don't have a thought process that says that the Social Security system in the government needs to take care of me in old age. But that's the average American. That's the average person in the Western world says, hey, the government needs to be able to take care of me. So we all with our paychecks, right, fund Social Security with the idea of being able to do that. Why? Social Security doesn't fund anything for your grandkids. It funds you. If you have a pension, if you get a retirement, it's about you being able to live in retirement, being able to make money and, and survive and have some kind of quality of life after I don't work anymore. This has become a high level goal that most people don't attain. Most people in their mind, they think they're gonna work for life, they don't save for retirement, they don't have emergency savings in the bank, nor do they think about the long term. God wants us to think a lot bigger than that. But most of us tend to say one of two things. If I would have known that I was gonna live this long, then I hope I would have saved more money or I hope that the money doesn't run out by the time I die. But the second thing is, if I'd have known I was gonna live this long, I would take better, better, taken better care of myself. That's what people say. They've said this for generations, said it for like hundreds of years. This is how we continue to talk. So, so the perspective for me is we like live these really selfish lives and we just think about us. And the truth is we often just think about today. Like our focus is how can I get through this week? How can I get through this month? How can I get through this season? How can I get to this place where I'm this, I'm that? There's a lot of... And I'm not, I'm not dismissing these concerns that we have culturally, like being able to make a certain amount of money to afford a certain kind of lifestyle or building certain things. But the truth is, for most of us, our focus is on building a certain kind of life for ourselves. I want to have this. I want to experience this. 
I deserve this. This is the American dream for you to have a house with a white picket fence, for you to take vacation wherever you wanna go and spend whatever you wanna spend on that to the point where now we have credit that you can put things on credit because you deserve that even though you can't afford that, right? This is, what, this is the culture that we live in today and all of us are a part of this. This is why being in an environment like Elevate Life Church is so important because what's different about our church is we call ourselves, ourselves the incubator of greatness, right? And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit today but you need to be surrounded by people who can think better than what culture thinks. Because what culture says is as long as you're okay in life, it's all gonna be good. Now the, now the progression of culture and what we're navigating in the world today uh, requires a lot of different conversations because we've gotta think about what the world looks like in the future. We've gotta think about that now because the decisions we're making today is gonna determine the future that not we live in, the future that our kids, and grandkids live in. And honestly, we don't really have a desire to care about that, but let me talk to you today about why you should care about that. So there's three steps over the next few weeks I wanna to talk to you about. The first step to building the world of tomorrow that I wanna share with you today is you have to be willing to think bigger than big. So in the Bible, you look at, there's a story of a guy named Abram who God changed his name into Abraham. And when you look at scripture, when you look at the Bible, um, I'm gonna walk you through the story of Abraham. These, these are in your notes. You can download notes on, our, on the YouVersion app, on our church app. But all these verses are in your notes that you can reference. But I'll walk you through, just really briefly, the story of this guy named Abraham. So in Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abraham, leave everything that you know. You're comfortable here. You're comfortable in this, in this land that you live in. I have a promised land. I want you to go to the land that I'm gonna show you. And he says to Abraham, who's 75 years old, when God's having this conversation with him, he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will make you famous. You'll be a blessing to other people. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all of the families on the earth are gonna be blessed because of you. This is what God says to Abraham. God comes to him, he's just a guy living his life, 75 years old, childless. There's really no potential for any of the stuff that God says to happen in Abraham's life. And he's Abram at this point anyway, his name's not Abraham yet. So then we fast forward to Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, Abraham's living his life continuing to be on this journey towards the promised land, wrestling with what he felt like God said to him, wrestling with the dream that's in his heart, just like all of us do, and we're trying to figure out if it's ever gonna happen, right? This is where Abraham's at, he's a human being. Sometimes we read Bible stories and we think to ourselves that these people in some way weren't human when they were very human and very flawed. So Abraham is, throughout his life, navigating this discussion with God, like, God, you said you were gonna do this, you said you were gonna do that. So then we fast forward. In Genesis chapter 15, here's what God says to Abraham again. He, he zooms in and he says, I want you to go outside your tent and I want you to look up at the stars. And he says, try to count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants that you'll have. This is in the context of a conversation that Abraham's having with God saying, I don't have any kids and all my stuff is gonna go to a slave. And the Bible says, Abram believed the Lord and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. What does righteousness mean? Righteousness in scripture means that God looked at Abraham and Abraham was right with God because he believed what God said. Genesis chapter 17, we fast forward again. God's still talking to him about the struggle that they're having with believing whether or not this is gonna take place. Abraham, Sarah's idea, Abraham goes into, he, he, there's a servant that they had named Hagar. Sarah's like, hey, maybe what God wanted us to do is have a kid with someone else, and so go have a kid with this servant, Hagar. And God's like, hey, that's not what I wanted. So they had a son named Ishmael that wasn't the, the chosen son that God had designed them for. They went outside God's plan and tried to do it their own way, which again, all of us tend to do that. Like, hey God, you're not going fast enough with what you said was gonna happen, so I'm gonna have to go ahead and take command here, right? So what we all tend to do, Genesis chapter 17, God's talking to Abraham and Sarah about this. The Bible says Abram fell face down on the ground and God said to him, he made a covenant with him. Now you might not understand what a covenant is because most people don't in, in, in society today. A covenant in, in the ancient world, a covenant was like a legal contract. They didn't have really courts like we have them today. They didn't have a lot of laws like we have them today. And so what would happen is 
you and I would make a covenant. We would usually cut covenant together. There would be an exchanging of blood and we would make a covenant that I'm gonna keep up my end of the bargain, you're gonna keep up your end of the bargain and that's gonna be a guarantee. So this is how they established things like property lines. This is how they established like who owned businesses was we're gonna make a covenant in the sight of all these different people that we've made this promise to each other and they were gonna be held accountable to the promise that they made. The closest thing we have in the world today to a covenant is the concept of marriage. Now the divorce rate being 50% would still say that most of us don't understand what a covenant is because a covenant is not something you get out of. It's something you're committed to, not just for your life, it's something you're committed to for generations to come. Right, so think about it, think about it this way. If you and I live next to each other, we're neighbors, we build a fence and we say, okay, this divides your property from my property and we're gonna, we're gonna agree to that and we're gonna sign a covenant on there or cut covenant based on that, then what would have to happen is my kids and your kids would also have to honor that after we're dead. That's how covenants would work, is that they, they didn't just happen for a lifetime, they were progressive generationally. So God comes to Abraham and he says, I'm gonna make a covenant with you that I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. This, God is saying, on my end as God, I'm gonna guarantee that I'm gonna do my part and make this happen. What's more, I'm changing your name. You're not gonna be Abram anymore. You're gonna be Abraham because you are going to be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will be among them. And then, Fast forward in the same chapter, Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. How can Sarah have a baby when she's 90 years old? So I wanna, I wanna pause here for a second and mention this. This is 25 years after God's initial discussion with Abraham. Still hasn't happened. 75, we're late in the game, God. Like people die at 75 and they're not considered young. You know, even in the Bible too. So hey God, the sun thing, I feel like that's, that's the next six months, right? Because I don't know how much longer I got on the planet here. 25 years later, some of us are sitting here going, man, God gave me a dream six months ago and it just hadn't happened yet and I don't know what the problem is. I don't know if I can believe in God anymore. Because you know the past year's been a little bit difficult or the past couple years. Let me, let me, let me like clue you in on how God sees time. Okay, when you... Uh, create something, you're not bound by the rules of that thing. So I'll use this little clicker as an example. Whoever created this clicker, let's say I created it, put three buttons on it, okay? Does that mean that I now have to have three buttons on me and I can only have three buttons as the creator of the clicker? No, that's silly, that's weird, that's irrational to think about. It's completely illogical. We're the creation, right? God created us, he established rules and order in the nature of reality. One of those things is time. Everything on this side of eternity has a beginning, middle, and end. This is just how things work. It's how things have always worked, right? There's a start, there's a finish. You're born a day, you die a day, right? God's not constrained to that. Time, time is not a concept that God is subjected to. So what that means is every moment so people go, well, isn't, isn't there predestination? That's not how it works with God. We're, we're, we're thinking, we're trying to, what we do a lot of times is we try to apply human reality to God reality. So we say to ourselves, well, like, wait, hang on. Doesn't God see the future? Is it, is it, what does that look like, you know? God exists, this is what being omnipresent means. He exists in every moment, past, present, and future, all at the same time. Time is not a concept that God's constrained by. So we think beginning, middle, and end, it's just how our brains work. It's how God created us to work. He does not work that way. So, so just because I created the remote doesn't mean that whatever rules apply to this remote apply to me. The function of this remote is to change slides on this slideshow. Now it'd be silly for me to think that this remote could tell me now what I'm supposed to do. You know what Josh, your function on the planet is to change slides on a slideshow. No it's not, you can't tell me what to do. So here's what a lot of people think that are again delusional and honestly intellectually arrogant. They, they, they kinda believe in God and then they think that God is accountable to them. So people like Richard Dawkins, if you read Richard Dawkins you'll see him talk about this. 
in, uh, in the book, The God Delusion. He talks about how God is capricious and he's mean and he's evil and all of these things are on the planet that are so horrible. And how could a loving God create this much stuff that's bad in society and on the planet? This is a question that a lot of us have. Well, first of all, to put your, if you believe in God, to put yourself in a position where you have, you, you're allowed to have any opinion about what God does puts you in your mind equal with God that in some way he's accountable to you. This is, this is, this, this is similar to how parents and kids operate. Right? My kids are five and two. I am not accountable to them. They cannot hold me accountable to anything. Now, should I, you know, if they say, well, daddy, you're not doing something you asked us to do, well, sure, I should listen to that. But when I make a decision for our family, we're not taking a vote. Uh, the, the, the maturity, I mean, you think about this, a lot of us in this room are parents. The maturity that a five year old has, hopefully, is less than me at 35. I hope that's true. Can't guarantee that, right? Courtney would probably have something different to say if she's in this service. So my kids are accountable to me, but I'm not accountable to them. This is God's relationship with us. God is not accountable to you for anything. You can, you can, have, you can have whatever opinion you want about scripture, God, what the Bible says, all this different stuff, but you also have to understand your place in the order of things. You're the created being. God created a plan for you, and you can play a part in that plan or choose not to. Those are the options. You, you, you can question for sure, but honestly, I don't think God cares that much about what you think about him. He doesn't care that much about what I think about him either. Why? Because there's billions of people that have lived on this planet before me, and there's billions of people that'll live after me. The Bible tells me that my life is just a vapor. It's here for an instant and then it's gone. That's how God views my life. Now, now there's some really great things that are attached to how God views my life, but I also should put myself in the proper position, which is what God is trying to tell Abraham. Abraham, it's not your plan. It's not your plan for your life. Culture will tell you, have a vision for your life. No, do not. It is not your vision for your life. Ask God what his vision for your life is. Submit yourself to what God has created you to do, what he wants you to do. And there's a way, and there's a way to get there, and that's what we talk about here at Elevate Life Church. But if I put myself in a position where I start to question what God is doing or what God wants to do or how long God is taking, I am misunderstanding my place in the order of things. God, here's what you need to do. If I start treating God like he's the tooth fairy, God, here's what you need to do, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm gonna need you to make happen for me, here's where you kind of fit into the plan of what's going on in my life, and God, I need you to show up here, I need you to heal me, and if you don't heal me, I'm not gonna believe in you anymore. God, I need you to make sure that this happens because this is what I wanna make sure happens in this thing, in my relationship, and I need you to give me this dream, and I need you to make this happen for me. I'm, I'm uh, the little plastic remote control telling the person that created me, hey, I need a fourth button on here. I don't know if you know that, but there's a, there's a necessity here for a fourth button and you've only got three and I'm gonna need four and I'm like, hey, look, that's okay that you feel that way, but I gave you three buttons. So use the three buttons you got or don't use them at all, doesn't matter to me because you're a plastic remote. All right, some of you, this is a great parenting lesson that you're gonna, you're gonna hopefully take away from this. Your kids are not the CEOs of your family. So, so what a lot of people do is they go, well, like, my kids are gonna do stuff when they wanna do it. They'll never wanna do it, they're little kids. Well, like my kids are uncomfortable with that or my kids don't like that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna submit to that. It's like so many parents, they feed fear in their children or they feed anxiety in their children because they let their children decide what they're ready for. That's not how it works. That's not how it works with God either. You don't get to decide when you're gonna experience adversity. God does. I know that maybe doesn't align with your theology because a lot of us think that, well, God only does good things in my life. The Bible says God causes all things to work together for good. It doesn't say that it's all good all the time. God is good all the time, but our life isn't good all the time. So I'm challenging today, I'm challenging today the theology that you and I have like Abraham, hey God, you gave me a promise and it's taken too long. 
or it's not happening according to what I think should happen. Man, I'm 75, I'm 85, I'm 95. God, I'm 100 and you keep telling me that this, you're gonna make me a great nation. Keep telling me that my descendants are gonna outnumber people on the face of the earth, but dude, I'm 100 and my wife is 90. Like, do you not perceive what's taking place here biologically? This is like kind of how Abraham, if we were having the conversation with God today, this would be the conversation that we would be having. Which is kind of silly when you think about it. It's like if you tell your kids, hey, I'm gonna, go to the, I'm gonna take you to the store today and I'm gonna buy you a, a toy. And then an hour goes by and they're like, hey, why aren't you taking me to the store today? It's like we got a bunch of hours in the day today. I know how, I know how much time is left. Like my kids are illiterate, right? They can't read. They don't know how to use a clock, none of that stuff. They don't even know how long an hour is. For real, it's like, how long are we gonna be here? An hour. How long is that? It's 10 blueies. That's for real, a measurement of time in our house. How long is that? It's three blueies, that's about 30 minutes. Why, because they don't understand minutes or seconds or hours, I do. So if I say, hey, we're gonna go to the store today and buy a toy, I know the store closes at like 10 o'clock. Well, it's three o'clock in the afternoon and we haven't gone yet. Like it's taking too much time. We have seven more hours. What's an hour? I don't know. It's 10 blueies, right? So this is how our kids are with us. Where I can say, hey, I'm gonna go do this for you and it's not happening in their time frame that they don't even understand. You and I don't understand how God sees time. So we think, God, it's not happening for me in my lifetime, therefore I'm not gonna participate and I'm not gonna go at all. So here's what could happen with my kids. If I say, hey, I'm gonna take you to the store and buy a toy, but they decide to have an attitude between the time I say that and the time we go to the store, we're not going to the store today. Because that's a conditional thing. If God, you can read this in Genesis 17, if Abraham did not believe what God said, God would not have counted him as righteous. The Bible says Abraham believed what God said. He believed that God was gonna do it. That's a condition that we have based on the covenant. God makes you a promise, there's, a, there's an end you gotta hold up, which is called faith. You gotta believe that God's gonna do it and not try to do it your own way, not continue to question, not go, well, God, I'm not gonna do this if you don't do that. Don't put yourself in that position, you don't wanna be that. You're not on God's level. So this is, what, this is the context that Abraham and Sarah are living in. Then, then we get to Genesis chapter 18. And, and Abraham and Sarah have these visitors show up that a lot of people say are angels. And one of the person, one of the people says to Abraham and Sarah, I will return to you about this time next year and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation and Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. Sarah was long past the age of having children. The Bible wants to make it really clear to us they were very old. A lot of limits. A lot of reasons, a lot of excuses why what God says can't happen, a lot of reasons why we can't build the world tomorrow, a lot of reasons why life can't go good. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for God? I'll return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Then this part's just funny to me, so I left it in here. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. And then the Lord said, you did laugh. It's like when you go, hey, no, no, no I was kidding. I was just joking. She's just messing around, God. You know, like I, was, I wasn't laughing. She laughed silently to herself. She was sarcastic with God. How could this happen? God's like, you laughed. No, I didn't, I didn't laugh at all. I believed it all the way, 100%. I knew it was gonna happen. So God says he's gonna do something and then we get, to go along with the, we get to go along with the program or not. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of limiting beliefs that each one of us has in this room and they're maybe valid, but here's the thing. Every limitation that you have on your life is either something that someone said or gave to you that you agreed with or it's something you gave to yourself. God is not a limited God. 
He doesn't think limited about you, about how he wants to use you, about your destiny, about how healthy or free you can be mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. Your limitations that you have in your life are always self-imposed. Either you've agreed with them or you've decided what they are. If I say, Henry Ford said it, right? Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. This is what God was trying to navigate with Abraham and Sarah. I need you to think differently. I need you to not think limited by your age or whatever other restrictions that you feel like you have in your life. And a lot of us are messed up because we've grown up in a culture with leadership in the church that does not teach what the Bible says about how God wants to prosper you. And so we think to believe that there's unrestricted dreams and visions and futures in our life, that that is somehow prideful and arrogant and we should submit that and we should have a mentality of poverty as people that follow Jesus. That is absolutely wrong. In a, in a, it, at some point, we're gonna do a, a whole discussion of series on what the prosperity gospel is because a lot of people come to churches just like ours and they say that's a prosperity gospel church. And all the people that say that have no idea what the prosperity gospel even is or what the actual gospel is. John chapter 10, verse 10 says Jesus himself, he says, I came that you might have life and life to the full, abundant life. The word abundant in John chapter 10, verse 10 means a life that is more than remarkable. If you do not believe, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian or a kingdom person and you do not believe that God wants to prosper you, you do not believe the truth of scripture. 100%, I will put my hand on the Bible and say that. Because so many people misunderstand and they think that God wants to limit you in some way in your life. God doesn't wanna limit you in eternity and he definitely doesn't wanna limit you now. He is trying to take the limitations off your life and so stop agreeing with any limitation that's placed in your life. So Genesis chapter 21, that's what this story shows us. The Lord kept his word and he did for Sarah exactly what he promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth, for, she gave birth to a son for Abraham again in his old age. Just reminding you of what the excuses were. This happened at just the time that God said that it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac eight days after he was born Abraham circumcised him. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born and Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me, not at me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby, yet I've given Abraham a son in his old age? So in the context of this, I wanna tell you a story. So in, in the mid 19th century, London was plagued by poor sanitation. People in London would often dump raw sewage directly into the River Thames, which was the main water source for the entire city of London for drinking water. Tens of thousands of people were dying from cholera and other preventable diseases every year. In 1858, they experienced the Great Stink of London. That's what they called it, the Great Stink. The overwhelming stench from the contaminated river permeated the entire city. Parliament put up curtains all throughout Parliament that were soaked in chlorine just so they, couldn't, they, couldn't, they could try their best to not smell the smell. So from behind these curtains, they turned to a guy named Sir Joseph Bazalgette. He was the chief engineer of a lot of the waterways in the city of London. So he had this grand vision. He would build a network of sewers that would not only resolve the immediate sanitation crisis, but also accommodate London's growing population for generations to come. He designed an extensive network, and this is his original drawing that he actually made. He designed an extensive network that intercepted sewage flowing towards the Thames, and instead directed it eastward away from the city center to be released far downstream where the tides could carry it out to sea. The network consisted of 1,100 miles of street sewers leading to 82 miles of main sewers, which drained all the way out to the sea. And by the time the system was completed in 1875, it had a cost of 4.2 million pounds, which would be the equivalent of, around, uh, equivalent of around 536 million pounds today. But it proved its worth immediately. His sewers resolved the ongoing health crisis, drastically reducing cases of cholera and other diseases linked to water contamination. At the time, 
London had around 2 million residents. There were around 2 million people in the 1850s and 60s that lived in the city of London. The government of the UK said that it is theoretically impossible for London to get any bigger. Basil Gett said, we're gonna design the sewer system for over 4 million people. And, these, and the official people that were estimating the size of these sewers says, we cannot design a, a sewer system that big. There is no way that that many people will ever live here. And in spite of intense criticism, he decided to increase the diameter of the pipes that you see from eight feet to nine feet. And he said, we're only gonna do this once and there's always the unforeseen. His infrastructure is still the primary infrastructure in the London sewers and accommodates a population of almost 10 million people today. It's estimated that if he didn't think big, London would have experienced a similar crisis in the 1960s that they did in the 1850s. Only now, 170 years after its initial completion, are they making upgrades to this sewer system. Pastor Key says this, when you elevate your thinking, you elevate your life. Let me challenge you with something. The way you think about your life is not big enough. No matter how big you think, it is not big enough. This guy was an engineer that said, we have to build it for this. And everyone around him was like, we cannot build it for that. It's way too expensive. It's way too much money. It's way too big. And he said, we have to do this because there's unforeseen things. He didn't know that London was going to have 10 million people living in the city 150 years later. So Pastor Keith has always said, when you elevate your thinking, you elevate your life. That's like the motto of our church. Alvin Toffler said this, when you've got to think about big things while you're doing small things so that the small things will go in the right direction. Marcus Lamb, when he came to our church and preached, he said, he said this, and I love this thought. If you talk small about a small thing, it gets smaller. If you talk big about a small thing, it gets bigger. So here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55. The Bible says that God's ways, here's what God says to us. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This is again back to what I said before. You don't have the capacity right now to think like God thinks. You're the lesser being. I'm the lesser being. We're on a journey. God thinks vastly differently than we do about everything. Time, reality, the universe, whatever. So God says to us, you know, you read the book of Job where God talks to Job and says all this stuff that he did that Job didn't do. So God says to us, I think like this and I think like that. And then in Romans chapter 12, verse two, the Bible says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but allow God to transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So God says to us, says to you and me today, I think better than you and I do things better than you. And I wanna invite you into thinking like me and being like me and doing like me. And then what we do is what Abraham did. We go, but, but God, I got all these limitations or I have all these things that are, that are required for me. God is trying to get us to think like him. Culture is trying to get you to think not like that. The Bible literally says, don't copy the behavior, behaviors and customs of this world. Some of you grew up in families that were like poverty mentality, so now you still have that, and then you've become a little bit spiritual, so now you've spiritualized the poverty mentality, and you think that that's what God wants. But God can't get you to prosperity as long as you decide to not think like him. So as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my, my ways and my thoughts higher than yours. However you think, you don't think like God. You don't think like he wants you to think either. I have to have the humility intellectually to say that. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I don't understand. This is Abraham. God, you said this, I don't see it. His journey is our journey. Man, I'm gonna go do my own thing, try to figure that out. Well, that didn't work at all. That led to a lot of conflict and mess and the whole story of Ishmael. But then we think to ourselves, here's, and here's, here's the danger of being this way, is you can think to yourself that God agrees with you. So if I'm hyper dysfunctional, well, God agrees with my dysfunction. It's okay for him. It's what he wants for me. No, you're just messed up. You need to think like him. 
So some of you have had these generational thought processes like I know a lot of people in my life, the way that their parents talked to them growing up was, you know, we're not like those people. We're just normal people. We're just living our life. We're not really that special. We're not really that great. You know, not everyone can be special. We're not the special people. That's not how God thinks about you. The way God thinks about you is you're an individual, special creation, created for good works is what the Bible says. So if you think for, your, for a second that you're not special, you're not agreeing with God about how he thinks about you. If God didn't think that there's a great plan for your life, if he didn't want you to do great things for him, he just wouldn't have created you in the first place. So he's not put you on the earth to be a normal person living your life like, well, maybe we'll like uphold all the special people and maybe we'll just play whatever role in society and we'll never be known. It's not about being famous and it's not about being rich. It's about being everything that God has created you to be. And some of us have lived our lives and we've made so many excuses for why we can't be great and why we can't pay the price for that. And it starts with what we've been told by culture, what we've been told by our parents, what we've been told generationally. And so we can't possibly build the world of tomorrow because today is hard enough. So then people say, well, isn't this a little bit arrogant to think of yourself as special? Isn't this a little bit much, you know, to do all that? Is that really what God wants is for us to be arrogant and prideful? Those people don't understand what pride even is. Here's pride. Pride's like a spectrum. We all know what arrogant people are like. I don't have to describe that. Insecure people are just as prideful as arrogant people. And here's why. Pride, biblically, is thinking about yourself first. Insecure people are amazing at this. All they think about is how everything affects them negatively. All they think about is how hurt they are, how they didn't get invited to the party, how they're not that special, how they're not that great, how they don't have that much going on, how nobody loves them in a certain way, and nobody's gonna do stuff for them, and blah, 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 blah. All of us know insecure people. I've been on that side of life most of the time in my life. I've never been accused, I don't think, of being arrogant, but I've been accused of being insecure a whole lot. And if you're insecure, you're still just thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about anybody else. What's biblical humility? Biblical humility is I'm thinking of myself second and I'm thinking of other people first. This is what Philippians chapter two talks about when it says Jesus took the position of a slave. It wasn't about him, it was about them. You know what's unfortunate to me that I believe can change in our generation is there's not one person on the Forbes list who's a kingdom person. Someone's gonna be a billionaire. Someone's gonna be a 200 billionaire. Someone's gonna be the first trillionaire. Someone's gonna be the first quadrillionaire. And I hope that in our, in our, I hope in our generation, we can allow some people in the church and in the kingdom to think big enough about themselves to think that they can do that, but not for themselves, for other people. Think about the kind of impact. If you're a generous person and you're a humble person and you serve and your life is about other people and you put God first, think about the kind of kingdom impact you could make. You're not out here building $200 million homes for yourself to live in like you're living in a palace like a king. You're thinking about how can I, how can I fix in curable diseases? How can I solve problems that nobody else can solve because God has given me so much to build the world of tomorrow with? Poverty cannot do that. A person who's in poverty needs to be rescued all the time and they need someone else to come serve them. But in the kingdom of God, I believe that he has created us to be the people that build a better world. And in order to do that, we've got to think prosperity. And it's not just about money, so don't be silly and think that I'm just talking about money. You cannot be emotionally unhealthy and help other people get healthy. So if you live your life and you're emotionally unhealthy, you will will not just not help anybody else, you create a template for other people to follow. If you're dysfunctional in your life, 100% guarantee your kids are gonna be dysfunctional. They are not going to go above the level that you're at. If you're emotionally unhealthy and you live with dysfunction and you just maintain that dysfunction in your life, you are setting a pattern for the next generation to follow. You are building a dysfunctional world of tomorrow. I don't have to give you any other example than what's happening on the news every day. 
People look at this stuff and they go, I don't understand how all of this happened. It happened because we never got healthy, so then the people behind us are less healthy than us, but we were already unhealthy in the first place. Plutarch, who was a philosopher and an ancient Greek historian, he said that the person who is tipping over cannot straighten somebody else up. You and I gotta put our house in order first. So people wanna talk all this stuff about politics, about what's happening in the government, about who the president is, about who all these other people are, but they don't wanna look at the kind of parenting that they're doing with their kids. They don't, wanna, they don't wanna look at the way that they're treating their spouse every day. They don't wanna talk about what their relationship to alcohol is. They don't wanna talk about that kind of stuff because hey, that means I'm gonna have to start taking some personal responsibility and I would rather point the finger and say someone else has to fix it than to say I gotta take responsibility for myself. So I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this to critique us. What I'm saying is, is that God wants you to think better about yourself than you think about yourself. God wants you to think that you can be healthy because that's where it starts. Think that you don't have to struggle with the same stuff. Think that you don't have to be afraid of everything. Think that you don't have to live your life with anxiety. Think that you can prosper spiritually, emotionally, physically, and mentally. And guess what'll happen? God'll take you on the journey. Open up his word, apply it to your life, and you will win in life 100% guaranteed because that's what God wants for you. Jesus himself said, let men, let people see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You have to be great if you're gonna build the world of tomorrow. So I gotta think bigger than big about myself first. I gotta think that I can be great. I gotta think that I can win. I gotta think in the midst of the difficulty and the struggle and the pain that I feel, I have to think in the context of that, that man, I'm an I'm a overcomer. No matter what's happening to me right now, I'm gonna get on the other side of it and I'm gonna be a winner. You know where winning starts? Where winning starts is with you talking to yourself like you're a winner. The greatest thing you can do for yourself and the greatest thing that you can do for your kids is to have a great self-esteem, to love yourself, to believe in yourself, to know that God has created you for great things. Not prideful and arrogant, like we're better than everybody else, but man, we're pretty good. We're pretty special in this family. We've got a fingerprint that no one else has to leave, an imprint that nobody else can leave. So, so when you go to school today, remember what it means to be us. Remember the, remember the spirit that you walk in. Remember that you're an encourager when everyone else is being a discourager. <laughs> remember that you're a, you're a person that can love people that no one else can love. That's how my parents talked to me when I was getting raised. My dad, my dad, every time I left the house, every day he would say, remember son, there's two things you gotta do to win in life. Number one, you gotta give God something to work with, so give God something to work with today. Number two, you gotta give people something to respect. <sighs> This is the fingerprint. Each one of us has a fingerprint that no one else has to leave, an imprint that no one else can leave. We've gotta think bigger than big about ourselves and what God has called us to. So how do we do that? Step one, you gotta leave your comfort zone. Three ways to think bigger than big. You gotta leave your comfort zone. In the story of Abraham, God says to him, the first thing he says to him is leave everything you're comfortable with. Leave everything that you've known. Leave everything that you like. Honestly, we like some of our dysfunction. We like some of the ways that we are that don't work and we kinda want everyone else to adapt to that. And that's okay, it's human. But that doesn't mean it's gonna win. That doesn't mean it's gonna build the world of tomorrow for us to continue to be that way. So how do I get to myself, get to this place where I step out of my comfort zone? I gotta ask the effectiveness question. This is something that we teach all the time here at Elevate Life. How's that working out for you? And a lot of times we teach this in the context of coaching. Like if a person who, um, if a person who's never really had a good marriage comes to you and they say, hey, let me teach you how to have a good marriage, you would naturally ask this question. I don't know, man, how's that working out for you though? Like, cause you're not really winning there, <laughs> right? It's like if a person comes up to you at the gym and you know, they weigh 500 pounds, They're like let me show you how to do this exercise. It's like, I think I need to show you because you're not applying what you know. All of us can know the theory. Like I know that eating healthy is really good and important and it's more effective than how I eat, but the problem is doing it. I had a cheeseburger last night. I had a cheeseburger the night before. It's fine. 
I know how to eat healthy. I know that that's not a healthy way of eating, but I like it a lot. It's comfortable. <laughs> so I have to be willing to leave my comfort zone though and admit that a lot of times what I'm comfortable with doesn't, doesn't cultivate greatness. And it's not about me though. It's about the patterns that I'm setting for the people that are coming behind me. If I leave my comfort zone, I teach other people that they can do the same. Not, not just your kids, your grandkids and their grandkids and their grandkids that we're people that embrace the challenges of life head on. So in, it's not just about looking at other people that are telling us what to do. Look at your own life in every area of your life, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, so on. Do I like the results that I'm getting? Do I like what's happening? Do I like it? Do I think that, that it aligns with what God's best for me is? And if it doesn't, I have to get out of my comfort zone there. If I don't like the state of my emotional health, I have to change the inputs. What are the inputs that I can change? Maybe I can change the friends I'm hanging out with. The number one predictor of your mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health is the kind of people that you do life with. So maybe what's not working is you're just with the wrong people. Now they might not be wrong for everybody, but they're wrong for you. I don't like my, the state of my mental health. What am I putting into myself that's creating the output? So maybe don't watch the news all the time. Maybe unfollow some people on social media. How's that working out for you is the question that we have to ask ourselves. If I don't like the output, I have to change the input and become more effective. The second thing is we have to stay consistently persistent. So stay consistently persistent. This is something that we use to teach. It's called a triad. So I have to think consistency, be persistent, and do omnipotence. Now, a lot of people get weird about using the term omnipotence because it's like, hey, like, isn't that what God is? Isn't God omnipotent? Anywhere in your life where you're consistent and persistent, you develop power in that area and all power in that area. That doesn't mean that you're God and, you know, or like I could, you know, telepathy, like do telepathy and lift the ceiling up off this roof, although that would be super cool, right? That's not the omnipotence I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when you discipline yourself to be healthy emotionally, when you discipline yourself to win in your business, you become powerful in that area of your life. So what is consistency? Consistency is doing what works over and over again. When you know something works, you know, I had a, I had a professor in college that said, plan your work, work your plan, right? Plan what you're gonna do, know what works, work your plan. Pastor Keith says consistency is the key to all long-term success. What is persistence? Persistence is doing what you know to do, even when doing what you know to do doesn't seem to be getting any results. This is different than effectiveness, because sometimes we do have to change the inputs, but sometimes we're doing what God says and it's just not clicking right now. All of us have experienced this, so the Bible talks a lot about faithfulness. That's why the Bible talks so much about things like persistence and things like faith and continuing to believe, even when you don't see. In the story of Abraham, he had to consistently do what God told him to do. And he didn't do it consistently, right? I just talked about Hagar. But he also had to be persistent in his belief. He had to continue to go towards the promised land. He had to continue to talk to Sarah. He had to continue to navigate his own emotions, even though it didn't seem to be getting any results. So anywhere in our life where I can become disciplined and consistent, I can also develop persistency there. I go, okay, I'm gonna keep doing what I know to do even when doing what I know to do doesn't seem to be getting any results. Some of us, if you're like me, uh, maybe you're not, I hope not, you know, it's just like I've gone up and down a lot physically, you know, I've weighed a lot and I've weighed less than a lot, but I still don't weigh a little. So <laughs> Pastor Keith likes to talk about you know, I weigh more than him now, so I guess he likes to talk about how much I weigh, which is fine. You know, I don't have body dysmorphia yet. And, um, <laughs> and so, so I've had times in my life where I weighed 300 pounds, but times in my life where I weigh what I weigh now, which is around 270 and whatever, right? What you know when you're on a journey like that, when you're navigating things physically, is sometimes you hit plateaus. So in the gym, you know, if you ever start a weight loss journey or whatever, or like some kind of physical discipline journey, then what we all know is you're gonna have a time where it's kind of like rapid progress and growth and changes take place over a, maybe a short period of time. And then eventually all of us are gonna hit plateaus. We plateau, and instead of going from losing 10 pounds in a week, we, we're losing one pound in a month. It's like, well, and then it, it, naturally in people's mind, they go, I think it's just not working for me anymore. It's like, no, you're just in a plateau. You just have to keep doing it and then it'll click back into gear, right? 
because your body gets in homeostasis, all these different things. So we don't do this in our lives though. We don't, we're not very good at it emotionally. We're not very good at it intellectually where we just keep doing what we know to do. Sometimes we just tend to quit too soon when we should have just persisted through and kept doing what we know to do even when it doesn't seem to be getting any results because even when you don't see the results doesn't mean that they're not happening because you can't see things physically like your heart rate variability. You can't see things physically like your resting heart rate. You can't see stuff like that. But people will tell you that the more that you exercise, the higher your heart rate variability gets, which is a great predictor of your health, and the lower your resting heart rate gets. It's important, but it's not visible progress. So just because you don't seem to be getting any results doesn't mean that you're not making any progress because it's still effective. And then the third thing, and last thing for today, is you got to celebrate small wins because they turn into big ones. The Bible tells us don't despise the day of small beginnings, right? Pastor Keith taught me this when I was a kid. He still teaches it to me. But when you take care of the little things, the big things take care of themselves. So I want you to think about this financially, but I'm not just talking about financials, but I think it's a good example. So a recent study showed that only 20% of Americans receive any kind of inheritance. And of those 20%, 75% were from uh, parents, 15% were from grandparents, 6% aunts and uncles and other relatives, 2% were friends, 1% were siblings, okay? 45% of those who received an inheritance got less than $50,000, and the median inheritance was $69,000. Why do I give you all this information? The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 22, good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but a sinner's wealth passes to the godly. 15% of the 20% got inheritance from their grandparents. Now, I'm not gonna give you the breakdown of that because I'm not really that good at math. But a lot of us, we're struggling to just make it right now. And that's where our thinking is. It's like, how do I just make it? How do I just get by? You know, it's rare, honestly, in the culture that we live in for people to even save for retirement. Most people think they're gonna work till they die and then they get to a place they can't work anymore. They're like, I don't know what I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I guess I'll just go on Social Security. I talked about that a second ago. But what if you thought about an inheritance that you left to your grandkids? Maybe financially, maybe emotionally. You getting healthy emotionally, you can teach other people, especially your children and your grandchildren, what that looks like. The journey that God has you on and the lessons that you're learning and the tests that you're passing aren't meant to just be for you. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren. The word inheritance there in scripture means something that is rightfully theirs, something that belongs to them by right. When you are good, when you do things God's way, you pass down things that truthfully, in a very positive way, your grandchildren are entitled to. It's not money. Money's important. But my grandchildren are entitled to core values. My grandchildren are entitled to believe that they have a fingerprint that no one else has to leave an imprint that no one else can leave. They're entitled to that. That's the inheritance that I'm leaving. My grandchildren are entitled to faithfulness because I'm gonna be a faithful person. My grandchildren are entitled to being gritty and resilient because that's the kind of person that I'm gonna be. And I can pass down those same qualities because I can model it. But if I can't model it, I'm not passing it down. So hopefully, financially, we can leave a legacy too. Because think about this. The average American discretionary income is $20,000 a year. That means you and I, on average, have $20,000 a year we can do whatever we want with. That aren't for bills, aren't for other things. This isn't true for everybody. This is average. If you took half of that, and you invested it in an S&P 500 index fund, every year it would look like this. If you took $10,000 a year and you threw it in an S&P 500 index fund, which has averaged, the S&P 500 has averaged 10% a year, including crashes over the past 100 plus years, you would, after 10 years of investing $10,000 a year, you'd have $175,000. After 20 years, you'd have $630,000. After 25 years, you'd have $1,080,000. And this is because of your investment combined with the power of compound interest. This is financially how it works. So some of us, we take all our money, we spend it on ourselves, we set it up for ourselves. If you're in your 30s or your 20s right now, 
And you can take $10,000 a year and you can invest it in a, in a vehicle that can produce compound interest. Within 25 years, by the time you're in your 50s or 60s, you'll have a million dollars in the bank. Now that, we know that to be true, but most of us don't do that. And all of us have discretionary income. Some of us can make excuses, but again, whatever limitations you have are the ones you decide. But this is the average. I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but I'm just showing you financially. This is the investment combined with the power of compound interest. Every decision that you make has a compounding effect on everything that comes after you. Unfortunately, for most of us in this room, the compounding effect has been negative. You have generations of people who've gotten divorced in your family. You have generations of people who said, we're just normal and we're not that special and we can't win in life. You have generations of people who have a poverty mentality, generations of people who are emotionally unhealthy, generations of people who have mental health issues, generations of people who are alcoholics, generations of people that come before us that there's just this compounding effect, but you're supposed to be the one. You can be the one because God wants you to be the one. There was everything that came before Abraham and there was everything that came after Abraham because Abraham believed it. He took off the limitations and he said, God, I'm gonna believe that you can do it in me and you can do it through me. This can happen. This has happened and it will happen. But we've gotta decide to build the world of tomorrow because how you think about you is not big enough. No matter how big you think, no matter how successful you are or have been, you, don't, you still don't think about the great things that God has in store for you. You still have no idea about how big God wants it to be. Now that doesn't just mean financial, although hey, for sure, someone's gotta be the richest person in the world that's a kingdom person. I believe that could happen 100%. Someone's gotta be a, a doctor or a therapist who can help people emotionally and in kingdom and not turn gender dysphoria into some kind of thing that we should celebrate in culture. Someone's gotta be that kind of person that represents it. The only reason why it's not us is because we don't think that it can be us. And God says, you don't think like me. I, my thoughts about you are higher than your thoughts about you. My thoughts about your kids are higher than your thoughts about your kids. My thoughts about your life and your legacy and what, what I wanna do in your life is way bigger than what you think. And you've gotta to decide to think bigger than big, which is thinking like God. If Abraham didn't do it, it wouldn't have happened. If you don't do it, it won't happen. This is why I'm so grateful for Keith and Judy Craft as my parents because what's happening in my life and what God's doing through my life would not have happened without the foundation that they set and the battles that they fought. And there's still stuff to this day for all of us that we're like, man, God, I don't know if it's gonna work out. I don't know if it's gonna happen. God, I see this dream and you know, I don't know. Seems like it's not happening. But you're laying the foundation for everyone that comes behind you to build upon. This is what the world of tomorrow looks like. No one goes to a skyscraper and says, wow, look at that foundation. That's just so beautiful. What a beautiful foundation. You didn't walk into this building today and go, wow, look at all that concrete on the floor. That's amazing, that foundation. Without the foundation, the building can't be built. Someone has to do it. Someone has to say, we can build this. Someone has to see the future so they build a deep enough foundation. The Bible talks about the man that built his house on the sand. And so many of us live our life and we build our house on the sand and we think, man, hopefully it can just last for my lifetime and the house doesn't collapse before I die. And what God's trying to get you to do is build a house that's big enough that your family can live in for generations on a foundation that's secure and that's firm. But so many of us, for one reason or another, either we have all these limiting beliefs that people have passed down to us and people in our life haven't won. And so we don't think that we can be a winner. Or we look at ourselves and we just think, man, I just don't think I have what it takes. And I've been hit too hard by life and I've gone through too much. And I don't think that what God wants to do could actually happen. And God is constantly saying, come on, man. Like, just stay in the game. Just stay in the game. You don't gotta win. I've already won. I'm, I'm God, I'm on your side. I need you to be on my side too. But you gotta be willing to leave what you know because your version of this doesn't work. God does not agree with you. Stop looking for a God that agrees with you. That's not how it works. You're the lesser life form. You don't know what the heck's going on. 
You don't think big enough. Quit, quit limiting yourself. Quit living in insecurity. Quit thinking that you can't. Just quit it. Just choose to agree with God, but then at the same time, choose to do life God's way. You have to. There's two ways to live life, the wrong way and God's way. We can't, we can't mix this stuff. We can't say, God, I want what you want me to have, but I'm not gonna do what you want me to do. When God says do it, do it all the way, because that's what leads to what he wants to have happen in the world of tomorrow. It's not your plan for your life. It's God's plan for your life. It's not about us praying to God like he's, you know, a magical fairy in the air who's just gonna give us what we want. It's about being the kind of person that says, God, I don't know if my way works, I don't think it works, and I'm just gonna do what you tell me to do, which starts with putting yourself in a position to follow Jesus. Not just, not just say, yes, I believe in Jesus, but to open up scripture, read it, and apply it to your life. If you don't do that, there's no way for you to build the world of tomorrow. If you don't make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it's not gonna happen. And that's why he, that's why John chapter 10, verse 10 says this. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, life to the full, a life that's more than remarkable, but you've gotta to decide to make him Lord of everything in your life. The emotional diagnosis that you got is not supreme over what Jesus says about you being healthy. The mental health thing and whatever the therapist said does not reign and rule over what scripture says about you. What culture says about who you're supposed to be and how it's supposed to work and how the world works. None of that reigns supreme over what scripture says, but it actually can in our life if we decide that. Jesus being Lord of your life means you take the big thinking of God, and that becomes your thinking more than any other thinking around you or any other thinking that you can possess. Can you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? There's some people in this room, or you're watching online, that Jesus is just not the Lord of your life. You haven't given him your life. The way to know that you haven't given him your life is the fact that, is if you're doing things your own way. All of us come to this place where we're at the end of ourselves and we say, God, I just wanna have in my life what you want me to have. It's about surrender and letting go. The goodness of God leads to repentance. This isn't about feeling condemned. It's not about continuing to feel like you're not good enough. God has created you for greatness. He's destined you for greatness. There's struggles for all of us. There's sins for all of us. But the great thing about Jesus is he gave us the opportunity to be reconciled with God, to be reconnected with him in a moment and to start thinking big as soon as we decide to put him over everything and to think like how he wants us to think. So everyone that can hear my voice, just pray this prayer and repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you that your thoughts and your ways are better than mine. I repent of my sins, I turn of my way, and I give you my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Can we give those people that made that decision a big hand, Elevate Life? Thank you so much for joining us today. Here at Elevate Life Church, we exist to help people discover God, develop themselves, and deploy them into leadership with a biblical worldview. There's three great ways to do that today. Take your next step by joining a group, serving, or giving. You can text serve, group, or give to 972-945-9772. We say thank you for being those kind of people. We look forward to seeing you here soon on our YouTube channel.